Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, August 13th meeting of the New Market Conservation Commission. We'll go ahead and start tonight with the Pledge of Allegiance. We won't be standing, we're all just sitting here. <laughs> uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Sue, would you go ahead and do the roll call? Sure. Patrick Reynolds. Present. Sarah Finch. Present. Uh, Ellen Snyder. Here. Melissa Sharples. Here. Chris Blackstone. Here. Pam Kenny. I saw him. Here. Oh, <laughs> okay, excellent. Do we have any members of the public here for comments? Okay, I don't hear anything. So I'm going to go ahead and give the floor to Greg Jordan, who is our guest speaker. Um, Greg is the um, county forester for Rockingham County. And we're very happy to have him here tonight. He's going to do a presentation with which I have some slides. So I'll coordinate with him on that, but I'll, I'll let Greg go ahead and uh, have the floor. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, when, when you get those slides up, I'll sort of uh, uh, go through with those. So whenever you get the chance to share those, that'd be great. Okay. Let's just see here. But yeah, we're going to talk tonight about the um, the Heron Point Sanctuary. All right, let me just see here. And can you see, let me know when you can see that. I do. I see it. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. So I had a chance to go out there with Ellen, uh, I think at the end of June, and we had a nice walk out on the... The sanctuary and then I went back a couple weeks ago on my own just for a quick half an hour walk just to sort of scope things out again and and um, just put everything into place for me you know I hadn't spent a lot of time out there so it's it's nice to see it before I talk about it uh, this photo though is and, and you all know this property much better than I am so I don't mean for this to be a lecture hope it's a discussion that we can talk about managing uh, this property how the town can go forward doing that um, but I'll give you a quick assessment of the property, what I think the property history is, and then I think some of the management concerns are. Um, and this is a 2018 photo, so fairly recent, uh, pretty representative of what on the ground looks like right now. And I think the most outstanding feature, of course, is, is the all that undeveloped frontage on the Lamprey River, um, especially when you consider that get downtown and Route 108 right across the river. It's it's pretty amazing that it's undeveloped and just upstream of, of Great Bay. So really amazing. So if we want to go on to the next slide. Um, Let's see. All right, let me just, I thought I knew how to do that, but let me just, uh, I guess, let's see here. Where would that be? There we go. Oh, thank you. Well, this is the Fish and Game Wildlife Action Plan map, and I guess they agree with me. That purple there is the is the considered the highest. Oh, so, well, yeah, that's the highest sorry about that. I'm still no problem. I can blab away. But that's yeah. the highest highest ranked habitat uh, in the state. Um, the orange is the highest ranked habitat in the biological region, and so basically the seacoast. Right. So uh, they consider that like the like Gulf of Maine, coastal plain, or the coastal lowland, and the green are important uh, sort of supporting landscapes. So it's it's really awesome, uh, awesome habitat uh, tucked really close to downtown. So that's really cool. And I think Port um, Patrick, it's sort of that geographic location and the proximity to the coast, which really makes it uh, so unique. And though it probably doesn't feel like it sometime, um, the coast really is moderating the temperatures around Newmarket. 
right? So, and and so that sort of because uh, the winter temperatures are, are relatively moderate, that sort of influences the the plants that are growing there. And maybe it's the way I view competition of plants. You know, some people will say there are are plant communities sort of merging together, but I consider them sort of slamming together. Where you have the the oak pine, Appalachian oak pine, and, and southern species to the south, sort of running up the coast and slamming into our transition forest, where we have the northern hardwoods to the north, and the H bops, which is the hemlock beech oak pine forest, the stuff that we're used to seeing around here. But it's really diverse because of that, um, and also because of the coast. You know, one thing I consider is also, although it moderates the temperatures, it puts you a little in danger of coastal storms and high winds. And I think it would be important for the Conservation Commission to think about what would you do um, if a, a big coastal storm really wipes out this forest? Would you let, uh, would you do a partial salvage of the wood just to get access going again? Or you know, would you salvage the timber? So not to be a downer, but it is something to, to consider for this property just going forward. Uh, but as it stands now, it's a really neat, diverse property. In fact, it even has a butternut, which is right by the parking area, um, which is not a tree we see much anymore. Um, unfortunately, like most butternuts, it has butternut canker. And that's probably a introduced fungus, although we don't really know, but we'd have to suspect it is since butternut did so well for so long. This tree does have a newer canker. You can see that sort of black, pitchy, oozy mass. Uh, that top arrow. And so that's a new infection below it. That diamond shape looks like a scar or an axe blaze. That's an older canker. So this tree's been dealing with this fungal infestation for a little bit, but it's still got a nice healthy crown and, and it's still got a little bit of a future. Um, so it'd be cool to watch it and be nice if it produced some seed, but we'll see. Um, but when I walked through with Alan, I was just kind of keeping a mental tally of species. And there's at least 20 native tree species in there, um, including a lot of the southern, southern species like hickories, shagbark, uh, pignut hickory, pine, red cedar a little bit. So definitely got a little bit of the southern influence, I think. Um, let's move on, Patrick, to the next slide. Thank you. But anytime I think about a property, I hate to dwell on the past, but it's it's nice to go back just a little bit. And that sort of what happened in the past really influences what is going on today. And this is a 1992 aerial photograph. Um, the, the survey for the subdivision, I guess it was, I don't know what you call it, the Heron Point subdivision or, or what it was called, but that was registered in 1989. And so my guess is that um, somewhere around 1990, they did some clearing for the subdivision, right? So you can see a little bit of a loop road, which was gonna be Heron Point uh, Drive. And at the time, I think they did a little bit of, of, of lot clearing. I don't think they cleared the lots entirely. Uh, I think they sort of opened them up so builders and buyers would, would um, sort of envision where their houses would sit uh, in the subdivision. Um, uh, but it sort of it sort of set the stage and for the forest now, and there's some really neat uh, regeneration pockets as a result. It, even though it was meant for development, it sort of acted like a forest management practice. I have to see if um, yeah. sorry if yeah. anyone was ahead, trying Patrick. to get in. I just had a um, uh, someone contact me, and I wanted to make sure if they were waiting to get in, but I don't Absolutely. see that they are. Okay, okay, sorry. No problem. I'm, so I'm going to hypothesize a little bit now too. I haven't spent too much time on the land, but if I was going to guess, I would guess this was a sheep pasture from you know about 1810 to 1850, uh, when there was basically a sheep craze throughout all of New England. Shortly after that time, all the sheep moved out west to where it was you know easier to pasture and, and graze sheep. Um, and also when we probably had more cotton clothes, so a little bit less of a sheep craze. And I would guess that it went from sheep pasture to a dairy farm. Uh, 
between 1850 and 1870. And if it was a dairy farm, it would have been really well situated. They were probably very wealthy farmers, right? They had downtown and all the mills right there. So it was probably a great place for a dairy farm. Um, There's actually a picture uh, in town hall. Um, it's a picture that's really designed to show a, a full-size gondola that's in downtown Newmarket. But because of where it was taken, it's looking across at point is, and there's not a tree on the property. Yeah. There's it's just rock and grass is all yep. you can see in that photo. So I think you're right on. It was some sort of grazing farm. Obviously, it was not uh, a crop farm, but it was some sort of grazing pasture, even up until maybe the the turn of the last century. Okay. Well, I feel a little bit vindicate, vindicated, you know, so I'm not way off here. Um, uh, you know, I was guessing, right, that it was at least pasture until 1870, 1880, but it could have been as late as 1900 for sure. And, uh, you know, definitely, if, if you look at the ground between the rocks, it's very smooth in there. And that tells you that the land was plowed at least a few times to establish, you know, some grasses for grazing. It's not impossible even though it's kind of droughty in places that it, it could have had hay, um, that would assume they were manuring uh, with animals. The other thing that tells me that it was definitely ag land and, and not uh, hasn't been forest for a long, long time, there's no pit, pits and mounds, right, or pillows and cradles. So when trees get blown over in storms, they leave pits um, where the roots out of the ground and then when the stumps and all the soil sort of decomposes leave these mounds in front of it it's just it's just not there so we know history of agriculture and um definitely uh not a forest for a super long time um i would guess after it was abandoned i was thinking 1880s maybe 1900 i would bet that it grew back into pine and i would bet it was possibly clear cut for, you know, white pine boxwood at some point. So the, if you go through that forest, and I think we can move on, Patrick, to the next slide, please. You know, this is not the best photo. However, there are some trees out there that are probably pushing 150 years of age, mostly oaks, um, maybe some couple pines. This is a sugar maple. Um, and you can tell they're, they're pasture trees, they were open and grown. They have these big wide sweeping crowns and it's really neat to have those trees out there. It's, it's just not something that you can make quickly, right? So when you have these on a property, it's just so biologically important, ecologically important uh, to protect them. And we're just lucky to have all that diversity and history too. And then if we move on, Patrick, um, there is a set of those trees. 75 to 100 years old you know and it, if you ever read tom wessels you could guess that um you know what a, a 12 inch diameter tree is about 50 years old a 24 inch tree is about 100 years old and and these trees are mostly sort of in the middle like this oak that has lot 21 right on there um so you know 75 80 possibly up to 100 years old uh um sort of that matrix forest, you know, a big part of the trees. But we move on to the next slide. It was cool because, you know, as a forester, if I was managing a property for timber, I'd be trying to make many small openings. And that's basically what they did in the forest when they did this partial lot clearing. And they came in really nicely with regeneration. Some of them are oak dominated. Some have sugar maple, this one that we're looking at. There's a lot of black birch, and you can see that pine stump in there. That's about, uh, like I said, about a 30 or so year old stump. And so in a way, we kind of lucked out with that, uh, the way the land history went, that we sort of get a little bit of diversity in, in age classes here and there, therefore canopy classes too. Um, and they came into to, uh, really nice pockets. And if we go on to the next one, Patrick, there's also a, a small amount, but there are some newer pockets of regeneration 
um, from some small blowdowns. This one I think is from a little bit of beaver activity. This is right on the edge of the river. And surprisingly, it's full of oak and the sugar maple, you know, all some white pines, some things that you really want to see growing there. A lot of plants that are well suited to the site and they're not invasive plants. So that's wonderful. So we're setting the property up. There's potential here for, for good diversity in a lot of ways. So if we can move on one more slide, Patrick. Thank you. Um, this is a soils map. And then there's basically two soil types on the property split 50-50. And that one that says 140C, that's um, a soils complex. It's called uh, Chatfield Hollis Canton. And it's, and it's a mix. It's, um, uh, let's see, the Chatfield is sort of a very shallow um, glacial till, you know, lots of rocks as you can imagine, shallow to bedrock. Um, there's Canton, which is a really a, a deeper gravel, probably really good for oak and pine and they're very productive soils. And if we move on one more, Patrick, um, there's a lot of hollow soils. You know these from walking around there, really shallow to ledge, a little less uh, productive for tree growth. The other soil there um, on the property are boxford soils. And those are sort of, they're silty loams. There's some clay in there. Uh, they are productive. They do drain, but slowly. So when you get a lot of heavy rain, they're going to stay wet. And if we go on to the next slide, Patrick, please, you'll see that some of them look like this. And this is where some invasive plants are showing up. I think a lot of the, the drier soils, although they can definitely get invaded by invasive plants, and they probably will, um, these Boxford soils, these silty loams are sort of getting invaded first. And these are probably the places where you guys can start to focus some of your management efforts on, which I think is gonna be really important. And when Ellen, Ellen and I were out there, we saw a lot of this oriental bittersweet, that vine that you see all over the you know, edge of roads and it's very shade tolerant. So you'll see it in the forest too. I had, we saw Japanese barberry, European barberry, multiflora rose, there's quite a bit, um, autumn olive, uh, some honeysuckles, which there are a few varieties that are invasive, common buckthorn, glossy buckthorn. So you got a bunch of the, the fortunately I didn't see any knotweed along the river. So that's a bonus. Um, Sorry, I should that's admit, okay, Patrick, should, one more admit slide here. Admit someone to the meeting. Uh, yep. Okay. I'm in, in no rush. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have a few yeah. areas like that are starting to look like this, especially near the access road and a few pockets in the woods. And uh, they're at this point, the hardest hit areas. But um, for those of you who have managed invasive plants, you know, it could get a lot worse than this. So this is a good shot, good time to, to get in there um, and control these plants. And it can be done mechanically, right? You, you can pull or cut a lot of these plants. It's definitely going to take some effort, but it's going to be effort that's well spent, I think. Um, whether it's the Conservation Commission, I would be happy to help you. When life is back to normal a little bit, maybe some volunteers could help. And these pockets are fairly concentrated. And if you have folks that are good at identifying these plants, you could do a lot of work in just a couple of days here to really clean out these pockets. And I think it's pretty critical. You have such a beautiful forest. It's setting up uh, for really an interesting diversity over time. Um, and so you'd hate to see it get ruined by a heavy invasion of invasive plants. Over time, it's probably not gonna be an eradication effort, which would be lovely if that could happen. It's probably gonna be control efforts. There's so much seed source nearby that it, it's tough to keep the plants out, but um, it's certainly worth a shot. But ultimately it's about giving the natives a chance. And we can move on one slide, please, Patrick. Um, most of the invasives are shrubs. You do have uh, one invasive tree out there and it's starting to gain a little bit of steam. It's such a prolific seed producer and it's such an adaptable tree, which is the Norway maple. And I'm sure there are some Norways and abutting properties um, downtown. The seeds fly quite a ways. And, you know, even for folks that look at trees a lot, they look pretty strikingly different um, 
uh, here in this photo, but sometimes in the woods, you can scratch your head a little bit to know if you're looking at a sugar or Norway maple. So it definitely is gonna take a little bit of a trained eye to uh, identify a lot of the Norways, um, but it's really important to get out there and uh, find them now before they start producing a lot of seeds. I've run into this in our own town forest where I live and, and a butter has one Norway maple on a stone wall and it's it's seeded about of our town forest with Norway maple seeds and they're really tough to get a control of once they're well established they're just so firmly rooted so be an awesome time to uh, work on that so if you just cut them down yep. they'll just grow back from the stump they can stump sprout yeah the, the bonus is they won't produce seeds and so you know mechanical control like or I should say cutting will kill almost any of these invasive plants. And Ellen can probably tell you better than I about that. Um, but at least it has a silver lining that it stops seed production for a little bit. You know, yeah. uprooting would be ideal. Herbicides right. may, not, may not be an option for you, but they do work as well. Okay. So I think invasive plants is really one of the big challenges right now uh, for you at the Heron Point Sanctuary. Greg, have you tried girdling uh, bigger Norway maples? I haven't personally, but I know lots of people that have. And I, I don't find that they're super aggressive stump sprouters. So you could keep uh, knocking them back once they keep sprouting? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I find they're mostly, they're such prolific seed producers that they, oh, unlike a lot of invasive plants, you know, that is vegetatively, these ones really get going by the seed. Right. Yeah. Are they, uh, are they, uh, do people like them for anything? Are they good for firewood or any kind of thing like that? So I'm just thinking if we could get someone yeah. in yeah. to take them out for us, that's always sure, nice. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> at no cost. <laughs> well, if you're willing to let them run a chainsaw at the sanctuary, and some of them are fairly small. So you could just use a handsaw. They, yep. they, uh, where I grew up, we had these in the woods and we burned them for firewood. I wouldn't, yeah. I don't think they're wonderful firewood, but they, it's maple, so it's it's firewood. Yeah. And tap the trees. So there's one, <laughs> one silver lining, although I don't think you want to make too much syrup from them, but it's possible. These in, up in the 60s and 70s were sort of the wonder tree for urban environments because they're just so they're so tolerant of all kinds of conditions, air conditions, soil conditions, salt. So it really seemed, I think, you know, urban foresters thought this was the tree of the future. Um, and oh, you'll find a lot one. of our roadside maples, you know, the sugars, they can't tolerate the salt and they were replaced with Norway maples. And uh, Take that we made, I suppose. Um, but definitely wanted to keep out of the forest. So we can move on one slide, Patrick. So invasive plants, uh, definitely something you can deal with, I think. A lot of hard work. Invasive insects, tougher to, to deal with um, for all of us. Um, when, Ellen and I were walking the property. We just noticed that the, a lot of the ash on the property is not doing well at all. Um, at this point, if those folks, um, I imagine, have heard of the emerald ash borer. Um, so New Market is now considered in the generally infested area. So not that all trees have it, but basically the beetle, the emerald ash borer could be anywhere in town at this point. So the, the future of ash is, is a little bit tenuous. Um, but these ash, they weren't doing well. I don't think they have emerald ash borer yet. But they weren't doing well, and, and there's a lot of things. There's ash yellows, which is, it's just like a, it's a myco, pla it's a like a plasma. It acts like a fungus. It plugs up the arteries of the tree. It, this is kind of droughty site for ash, so they're a little stressed, I think, uh, by the drier soils in general. Um, some of you might recall we had this really big fungal oak outbreak called ash rust, which was this uh, 
fungal disease of uh, ash leaves, and it was really bad along the seacoast. Plus, um, you know, general stress and there's some native ash borers. All together, the ash on the property is just not really doing too well. If you look at that picture on the left, that sort of circle, pencil size hole, that is a native ash borer hole, and that is from your property. Right? And so these trees are stressed, so it's not too surprising to see that some of the native ash borers are finding the stressed trees, and they're going to leave uh, circular holes or, or oval holes. The picture on the right um, is not from your property, nor is it even from Newmarket. It's towards the Concord area. But you see that D-shaped hole sort of right in the middle? That is the classic emerald ash borer hole. So when you see uh, an exit hole in the tree with one very flat side, and if you were to turn it, it looks very much like a D. That is the emerald ash borer. So that is what to look out in the future. Um, but ultimately, ash has a low stocking. It's not very prevalent on the property. It's not going to be really a big part of your property going forward. I think oaks and things are more the future for this forest. But something to look out for just in general. Maybe we can move on one slide, Patrick. Can I, can I just ask you a question about please. that? Um, yeah, please. So if we see um, uh, woodpecker action on an ash tree, does that indicate that it would be native ash borer or does that also happen with the emerald ash borer? It happens with the emerald ash borer and probably more frequently the native ash borers uh, are a little bit deeper inside the tree. Whereas the emerald ash borer, it feeds just under the outer bark in the phloem, right? So it, if you, if you just peeled back the bark just a little bit, you're going to find the emerald ash borer. And uh, the woodpeckers are actually more attracted. They love eating emerald ash borers. Unfortunately, they can't eat enough of them. They just, they're a biocontrol, but, but the ash borer outpaces them. But what you're going to find is in the upper crowns of ash trees, and this will be the first symptom, you'll see a lot of woodpecker activity, but they're going to be scraping away that sort of grayish outer bark. And if you notice that bark on the right is kind of a yellow, yellowish we call it blonding right so they scrape away the outer bark and the ash trees will look really yellow typically starting at the top of the crown and then working down as the ash borer sort of moves its way down the tree right so once you see a tree that's getting yellow then i live in stratford and i'm starting to see that around some of our trees you know the infestation is really bad but it probably means once you see that yellowing that that blonding bark the ash borer has been around for you know three, four, or even five years. So it's well established at that point. But that is the first visible symptom. And the trees can even look pretty healthy, you know, nice full crowns. Um, but it's, again, you look for the woodpeckers and the blonding bark. So. Yeah, I've been, I noticed on a street near my house that um, uh, almost every ash tree is looking bad right now. Like yeah. they're all looking like they're on their way out. Yeah. So I kind of alarmed by that. Yeah. And I, I don't know if they're suburban ash trees or not. You know, I, I use that in quotes, but um, ash and other than green ash in suburban areas, it's it, it gets really stressed and very susceptible to ash yellows, uh, which is a uh, plugs up the pores. So ash just has a tough time unless it's green ash on the city streets. So it's it's not looking too favorable for ash at the moment, but the future is, is a little more promising. A little more worrisome on your property, and Ellen and I found this, a lot of this hemlock's looking really bad. Um, notice this white fuzz is what's known as hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, a non-native insect, um, you know, it's knocked back by really cold winters. Last winter was basically a bust. Um, and so the population is at at least a five-year high. Um, and so the ash trees are, I mean, the uh, hemlock trees are looking pretty thin. But you combine that, I don't know if you can see on the underside of the needles, these little ovals. We have these uh, waxy looking ovals. Most of them are yellow and brownish. That is the elongate hemlock scale. And so it's kind of a double whammy. Um, uh, you got the two invasive insects. And when you get those two in insects together, the hemlock woolly adelgid and the elongate hemlock scale, both are uh, Asian 
Asian insects originally, you can have very rapid uh, mortality. Your trees can die very quick, unfortunately. So I crossed my fingers for a, you know, a cold snap this winter, like a zero degree for a two or three day snap. That'll help. Um, but the, it's a little concerning because most, not most, a bunch of your hemlock is right on the river. So the question is, what do you do if these trees end up dying? And, and there is a decent chance that a number of them will die. They look so thin already. So there's going to be some dramatic potentially to the shoreland. Uh, other than crossing our fingers for cold temperatures, which, you know, it's, it's tougher to get on the coast. There are some predatory beetles and I'm trying to interest some of my colleagues with the state uh, who are raising these beetles. I would love if they would possibly consider your, your uh, property as a, as a release site. They are releasing these beetles all around the state. It looks really promising, like a decade or two decades out, but we got to get to that point. And so I hope that we can get there with your trees. Um, but it's something that the commission should really be thinking about what to do, if anything, about the hemlock on the property. You know, I'd imagine that the best thing to do is if the trees die to leave them standing on the shoreline and let them fall into the water primarily. You don't have too many trails underneath the hemlock. So there's some safety hazard, but uh, ecologically, it's pretty worrisome to me for the river and also just generally, uh, it's really a, a nice tree to have mixed in throughout the forest. It's good for diversity of birds and a lot of animals are utilizing the hemlocks. And so I really am worrying about hemlocks in the coast in general. Uh, it's, you know, I go to some places like Stratum and Exeter and, and there are just stands that are looking like they're on the verge of blinking out, especially this year. I'm getting daily calls about the, this insect right now. And so you have those two insects to contend with. Um, maybe we can move on, Patrick. Yeah, and so here's a little, little picture of the shoreland. Um, definitely an erosion potential. If you look at those trees on the left, by all rights, those hemlocks should be really thick. There's, there's no reason you should be seeing into the upper crown and that's because of the insect infestation. And so they're definitely not at the point, you know, they're not, uh, there's no imminent mortality of these trees, but if, if the next season or two doesn't improve, well, then they could be pushed uh, towards that edge. And again, a lot of your shoreline uh, has hemlock and aesthetically it's gonna change and ecologically there'll be some big changes too. So maybe we can move on, Patrick, thank you. So this one, this little slide I threw in, um, this is how I sort of view uh, forest development over time. You know, and, and um, I would think that the goal for this property uh, would be to develop a really diverse, um, diverse forest. It has a lot of age classes, a lot of canopy layers, a lot of species diversity that's gonna protect, um, you know, different insect infestations. and having all those age classes and, and canopy structure will buff you against the wind storms a little bit. You know, we to have some really old trees and you're already on the way there with some of those old pasture trees. I like to have some areas of young growth, which you have um, some big dead trees, which um, trees are gonna die and that's gonna be a natural thing. And they'll end up falling over and being coarse woody debris on the ground. And so a lot of your forest is in this the second stage at the point, the stem exclusion. So it's really kind of a younger forest, even though the trees might feel kind of older and majestic, right? They're still competing largely the crowns. You haven't had a lot of mortality other than uh, where there was some timber harvesting, right? So we haven't really got that understory reinitiation where where the canopy starts to fall apart a little bit and you start to get, uh, you know, more trees coming into the understory and those multiple canopy layers. You know, and we're talking centuries here to get to this sort of a, an older multi-age community. In my mind, I can envis envision that for this property. Um, you know, how do you get it? You can wait, certainly, you know, time will bring that um, and, and disturbances will bring that. As a forester, I, I sometimes think of forest management like uh, cutting trees and that is certainly a possibility, although you have some earth, 
some things that would preclude that, you know, the access is a little difficult. Um, you got to travel through a neighborhood if you were to bring in logging machinery and you're right on the river. So that may not be a high priority, but you could induce diversity through forest management, but it doesn't have to be commercial forest management with big logging machines. It, it could be non-commercial work. It could be going into some of those uh, pockets that were created for that lot clearing and doing some pre-commercial thinning and maybe thinning and favoring some of the nicer oaks or, or where there are pockets of you know, dead ash or dead hemlock, perhaps fostering a new generation of trees a new, or a new cohort of trees, right? So it could be non-commercial uh, uh, forest management, just over time to just develop that really diverse uh, canopy. Um, but no matter what you do, it's, the forest is gonna need help with these invasive plants that are there. Um, so I would envision that being the top priority for the Conservation Commission in the town. Well, if we have any more slides, Patrick, or if we've hit the end here. Uh, yeah, this, I was, this is a little pocket and to me, it's starting to show some good diversity, perhaps not the best photo. Now this little pine, which is just about 30 years old, very healthy. Um, so that sort of goes back to the time of the lot clearing. There's a lot of like, nice hardwoods in there. There's a probably a 75 year old oak in the back and there's just a lot of diversity here. There's a lot going on from a structural standpoint. Um, and so in my mind's eye, if I look out, you know, 50 years, I could see a, a really diverse uh, forest in a lot of different ways. And uh, so the question is, can you get it there? You know, so, but I'd be, I think that's the end of the slides, but I'm, that happy. is, that's, it. that's yeah, the last I'm, show. Yeah, I'm happy to talk management with you or any questions. Does anyone have any questions for Greg? It's not a question. I just wanted to say that was awesome. I could listen to that all over again. <laughs> it was so content uh, dense with so much information. I feel like a really oh. good stand up comedian where you miss half the jokes because <laughs> you were laughing. I feel like I was taking notes about some of your soil comments, and I'd like to go back oh. and hear what you were saying when I was writing things down. It was awesome, Greg. Yeah. Well, I'd love to go out to the woods with you all sometime and look at it in person. I think it's more fun and we could talk soils then and invasive plants and all that stuff. Forestry, which I, I like talking about. Uh, it comes across like you do. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah I that would be great. Yeah. Norway maple. Yeah. And um, I understand it being invasive just because it's not native, but is what's the risk there? Does it choke out other things? Is it overpowering everything else um does it introduce something else that's not native i mean what's yeah. the risk there yeah the the risk is that it's a prolific seed producer it really makes a lot of seeds and it's very shade tolerant and so it can hang out under your dense uh, forest there you know it's kind of a shady forest at this point but norway maple can hang out and grow there it basically, it, it's going to soak up all the regeneration space. So say we have a, you have a disturbance, you know, say the hemlocks die because of the adelgid or some trees blow down in a windstorm. Well, it's going to be the Norway maple that's poised and ready to sort of take control of that growing space. And so if it would just kind of behave and just not be so prolific, it'd be okay, you'd actually add a little diversity to the forest, but the problem is it becomes one of the dominant trees in the forest. And I've seen this in some places in Eastern Massachusetts, you know, where it's, there's like ash, box elder, Norway maple forest, and it's a big component of the forest. So instead of growing sugar maple, red maple, and some of the native species, like a Norway maple forest and low diversity, and you know, as a forester too, I'm thinking about uh, timber value and it's basically zero here, right? So no one wants it for firewood, no one wants it for saw logs. So you don't even have that going for it. Yeah, yeah, so it is dangerous. Thank you. Yeah. Greg, I know when we talked, um, be nice as, as Chris was saying that, you know, what you provide is really great, fantastic information. Um, should we compile that into sort of a very, draft management plan? Should we hire someone? Can you write that up? Or what, what would be a good way to um, capture what you've provided tonight? 
Um, I mean, I could write a summary of, of my thoughts. I'd be happy to do that. Um, in terms of a management plan, I am a strong believer in every property having, a, you know, some sort of written plan. You know, without a written plan, you don't really know what you're aiming for. And so, you know, a, a forester, a wildlife biologist, an ecologist that could write some sort of stewardship plan. And again, it doesn't have to be a plan that is prescribing big timber harvest, but it is a plan that's prescribing how to deal with disturbances, how to deal with invasive plants. Um, I think a professional would be really great uh, for you to write, have a plan written by. I am certainly happy to write a little summary, but I don't think that I would be the person that would be writing the detailed plan to be someone that the town would consult with unless the conservation commission was to do it themselves but uh, but i'm a strong advocate in having a written plan for every piece of property i think it'd certainly help us to at least have that summary um which we could then um you know pair with some of these pictures as a as a jumping off point whether we we can get you know, a professional to do it, or we try and do it ourselves, or um, e at least we have a, some documentation about what we should be doing there. Because that's, you know, one of the ongoing challenges that you probably have heard from many conservation commissions is they don't really have, you know, a budget to manage the properties that they they have, because there's no sort of revenue force that's Right. consistent right i mean there's there's change of use but it's not you don't know consistently what what that revenue is going to be so you can't really plan around it um but yeah certainly that would help us um i think um i don't know if it'll happen in the next 10 years or or when it will happen but i see this property when you look at new market and its development as becoming perhaps one of its most important public pieces of property at some point because um, the downtown area is a popular area people like to walk there there's a lot more people living in that area and you know one of the problems is this place doesn't have great access but at some point in the future there may be a footbridge across from downtown to this property at which point you would probably see a lot more use of the property which would be good because i don't like i said there isn't there isn't a large public park right in downtown there isn't one there's a small one and it's being eroded by sea level rise so potentially this could be that future place where people go to you know take a walk in in the woods so um i do think that that we want to safeguard it and we want to do whatever we can to manage it as well as we can because i do think it's a very important resource the other question i had for you is um so with sea level rise is that going to affect those trees, those hemlocks, I, that was what I thought possibly could be killing them. I was wondering about that because we've seen high tides, they're much higher and they're getting higher all the time. So what, what does that do to trees that are along the river? Yeah, I'd be, I will, I guess I will speculate a little bit, but um, I don't know if the, there's an increasing salt or salinity in the soil, but if, if it was, uh, the, those hemlocks wouldn't tolerate it very well. And so there's two things they wouldn't, all the trees, they don't, wouldn't tolerate the salt very well. And they also wouldn't tolerate a, a higher water table, you know, so if the, the level of the river was higher, um, the roots need oxygen of the trees. And so they have established themselves and the roots have gone probably as deep as they can before you know, there's no oxygen or not enough oxygen for the roots. And so if you have a river that's at a higher level, um, it's bad for tree roots because of oxygen and, and the salt would be an issue too, but it's not a, a problem that I've dealt with really professionally yet. Um, but I would just hypothesize it could be problematic. Yeah. Um, 
So back to the this idea of a um, plan, um, it seems like it would be really beneficial to pursue that as well. Um, because as Patrick said, this is a really important property. It's there are invasive plants, but it's also really fairly free of invasive plants it in is. some regards, as you mentioned, Greg. And um, I wonder if it would be beneficial to at least go out and explore, get some quotes from foresters. There's not very many. There's probably like two <laughs> that we might be able to talk to to say, you know, here's what we have. We've got great information. We've got all this background. What would it take to uh, write, a, you know, a management plan that would guide us in the next 10 years? I think so. And I mean, I don't, cost is all relative, but it's a, it's a, a relatively small property, so it could probably be done at a relatively reasonable price. You know, um, you know, mapping is fairly easy. Um, inventory, if you want it, is is could be fairly easy. Um, and I think having a plan to me is pretty critical. Even a, a simple plan or an ecological study, especially if if you think it might be used more by people in the future, um, to know what resources that are there. Um, how they'll be impacted by people because they definitely will, and it will change. Um, will change the land. I, I love to walk there, but it will change it, especially if there's a lot more use on the shoreline. Um, that will change how wildlife are going to use that shoreline, and so it's it's important to know how, what the use might be, what the values of the land are, and how you might um, mesh the two if you need to. And so a plan. Even a simple one is, is pretty critical, I think. So we do have quite a bit of money in the conservation fund, and I'm a believer that the conservation fund is, you know, historically is used a lot for land conservation, but because New Market and other communities are acquiring, have acquired a lot of land, we need to shift some of that focus to stewardship. <clears throat> yeah. So I would uh, be willing to make a motion that we get some quotes to develop a management plan for here in Point Sanctuary. I second that. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Why, why don't people just call out their names so it'll probably be easier for, uh, oh. for Sue. So I'll just do a roll call. Uh, uh, Sarah? Aye, in favor. Melissa? In favor. Uh, Ellen? Yes. Sam? Yes. Chris? Yes. And Patrick is a yes as well. So I'd be happy to work with uh, Greg. He's got, you know, lists of foresters and try to, um, you know, put together a little scope, I guess, of work and uh, try to get some quotes for the next meeting. Would that be helpful? That, that sounds great. Thank you. Can I ask something? Is this, sure. to, is this going to include, um, besides a forester, um, a soil scientist and a wildlife biologist? Is that all of everything? So, I mean, Greg can, uh, can talk about this, but um, the foresters who are working in this area are pretty capable of talking about soils. Okay. They also can talk about trails. Okay. Uh, and they can talk about wildlife and I can help comment on that as a wildlife biologist. So I think we have between the, you know, the, the ex expertise on the Conservation Commission of all of us combined and uh, a forester, I think they would be able to cover all of the issues. Wonderful. Okay, I you. consider foresters sort of the generalists of the natural world. And so yeah. most, most foresters are, they're ecologists, they study soils, wildlife, um, of course, silviculture, um, you know, plant, you know, botany and things. I take a, a high view, a, a favorable view of foresters generally. Okay. Yeah. As being capable of this kind of project. Certainly. Thank you. The other thing I would be happy to do is um, maybe in September um, schedule one or two work days. So we start going out there and doing some work on the invasives. Yeah. If people are interested. Absolutely. Uh, Greg, that's one question I did have for you. I mean, obviously, it does, the invasive isn't going to be solved in like a day. Is this a situation where just anytime we're out there, 
pull in plants for half an hour is helpful or do we want to just do more structured events and have a couple of them throughout the fall and the spring just kind of whenever people are available i think both sam um gotcha. I'm, i think with work days you can involve more people and, and you can get quite a bit done but it's for me it's tough to walk a trail it can be kind of distracting but i see invasive plants and i just start pulling in it but it makes a difference because each one of those plants you pull are seed producers generally and so um i would advocate both actually yeah. Gotcha. So yeah, I have a lot of bittersweet in my yard, and yeah. uh, it's my mortal enemy. So yeah, I spent a lot of time walking around my yard, uh, finding little uh, burning bush sprouts. That when I moved in, there was a big burning bush that I ripped, still showing up. So I spent a lot of weekends scouting for that. So you're welcome to come over to my not weed <laughs> yeah. nightmare. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe if we if we did do had some open work days and we publicized it, there are some people that are very interested in this property and have stepped up before to do volunteer activities out there. Um, we could have them come and then maybe once people are sort of trained in recognizing um, some of these plants, then we would encourage and say, hey, yeah, if you are walking around and you see something, go ahead and pull it up, you know, especially if it's just one or two plants that are just starting out. Um, but I think that could be the benefit of doing a planned work day. Um, like there are, there are quite a few people that go out to this property on a regular basis. Um, cause we heard from them when we had to close it for a while <laughs> and we know they're out there. Um, and, and that's great. They're strong advocates for doing stuff and they, they helped with some of the down trees that were blocking stuff in the past. So um, I'm sure we could get some people out there to, uh, to would be interested in learning about, you know, what to remove. And after you remove it. Right. Yep. I'm sure Ellen can help you with that. UNH also has some fact sheets on how to dispose of invasive plants um, on our website. So. Um, yeah, it depends on the plant, right? Because some right. plants you can you can pick out and leave to dry, and they're they're good. And others are so bad you want to either get rid of them or or burn them or something. Yeah. 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 Just I'll say what I do when I'm out for a hike and I find a plant and I pull it up, I just hang it by the roots in another tree, just so the roots will dry out. So. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Greg. We really appreciate you uh, coming and doing this. And uh, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Love to get out there with you all sometime. Yeah, we'd like that. We'd like that. We'll we'll let you know maybe when that that event in September is, so that if you could come, that would be great. Happily, yeah, I'd like to. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yep, I can stop the share. Is that better? Does that work? Okay. Um, approval of minutes from June 11th, since we didn't have a July meeting that was attended. <laughs> Um, did everyone get a chance to review those minutes? Any questions or edits? Okay, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from June 11th, 2020. Second. All in favor? I'll just go ahead and read it again. Uh, Patrick, I'm an I. Sarah? I. Melissa? I was not at that meeting. Do I have to okay. abstain? You can abstain or you can, it's up to you. Okay. Okay. Um, Ellen was an I, I believe, is that correct? Yes, Sam? I. Chris? I'll abstain. Okay. All right. Who else is on? 
Uh, Drew is on. Drew is on. But I, I don't think we need him as a voting member tonight. Um, but I didn't know if he... Well, that's three... Wait a minute. I only have three... Three yeses and two noes. Or two abstentions. So who am I missing? I voted aye. Sarah voted aye. Melissa abstained. Ellen was an aye. Sam was an abstention. And so was Chris. So we had three, three, I believe. So it's three, zero, three with Melissa, Chris, and Sam abstaining. Yeah. Okay. Ellen, can you share the treasurer's, the financials, or do you not have the ability to share no, the screen? On this computer that I'm on here. Okay. But um, I don't, I think, um, I don't think you need to see all the, they're kind of okay. complicated. I don't think they're, there's, there's too much complication. <laughs> uh, I think I can summarize. Okay. Are you ready for that? Yep. Okay. So the uh, conservation fund has a total of $240,878.54. And that includes, so that uh, the subset is $764.46 from, of which I don't think there's been a change in that for a while. So the overall for the cash is $240,114.08. So a fair bit of money. And two current use deposits were made uh, on June 10th, 2020, $6,250 from 67 Langs Lane. And seven thousand, same date, seven thousand dollars from seventy-one Langs Lane. So that increase in our budget or our balance from last month or the last period that we got the information was from those two deposits. Okay. Okay. And then, um, yep. So any questions on that? No. Um, I don't think I got. We got all the information on the general fund, and I'm still not entirely clear. Uh, that's the roughly a little bit less than $3,000 that comes from the general fund, and 2,000 of that is for um, part-time salary for Sue, I believe. Um, and also the fiscal year ends June 30th, is that right? That's right. So, so this information we have is for, uh, I assume was the end of June. You know, we, we had money left over, and I assume that goes away. I don't remember how the budgeting works in New Market. If that money then goes away and we start fresh July 1st, does anybody know? Sounds right. Drew? That sounds right. Yeah. So basically, we didn't uh, spend our budget from the general fund, which was, again, a little bit under $3,000. So we were good for last year. And I believe that 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 does reflect the money that we spent for the Tucker property. That's already been taken out, right? Yeah, for the overall balance of cash, yeah. yes. Yeah, so the balance, mm -hmm. we should have 240,000 uh, plus in the conservation fund, right? Okay, yeah. so we do have, um, we do have one, one bill to pay. Um, uh, that just came in, um, and it is related to the Tucker uh, purchase. Um, let me just find that. Um, it came from CELT, and it is an invoice. Sorry, I had this pulled up here earlier. Um, again, with that purchase, we had to, um, we couldn't go over a certain amount. And um, so we ended up with a balance owed to sell of $985.78. And this was reimbursement to sell for project costs paid at closing of the Tucker property. 
So they paid this for us, but this was money that we had agreed to pay back to CELPS once the deal closed. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? What was the amount again? Can you repeat? It is $985.78. Great, thank you. And so um, I would make a motion that we go ahead and uh, pay that uh, invoice um, uh, for sell. It's I can second that. Okay. Uh, Who seconded? Hey. Chris Blackstone. I'm sorry, I should have said my name first. Thank you, Chris. Sure. Okay. And Patrick is an aye in favor of that. Sarah? Aye. Melissa? Aye. Ellen? Aye. Sam? Aye. Chris? Aye. Okay, so I'll make sure uh, Carol pays that for us. Okay. So the only other um, was the Schottmeyer Fund, uh, and as of June, June was six thousand six hundred thirty-three dollars and eighty-eight cents. I know they've um, approved up to five hundred dollars for. I think so. I think that's we're getting a lot of background noise. Is someone? Yeah. Yeah. That's all the uh, treasurer's report I have. Okay. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, Planning board, Sarah, did you have anything to share from the planning? No, nothing, no updates. Okay. All right. Um, we don't have a town council rep yet, so still waiting to hear on that. We still um, have an alternate. Um, we still have an opening, even though the town isn't, isn't um, advertising for one, but we still have one alternate position that Ellen moved out of. Okay. So you might, well, you could let Wendy know. I will let Wendy know. Okay. All right. Um, I'm gonna jump around here on the new business, old business stuff. Um, the first thing I actually wanna talk about is the Neil Mill Road parking. Um, I don't know how many people heard about this. I know uh, Melissa did probably because she's on the front lines as our social media coordinator that we had an issue with Neil Mill parking. Um, there was some concern um, both from the fire department and from a farmer that uh, mows on the gate that there wasn't enough room to get by. And so uh, I worked with um, Chief True and Rick Molaski, and they were nice enough to um, go out there and uh, mm -hmm. visit with me. Oh, and Steve Fournier came as well. And what we figured out was that uh, Rick with uh, public works could go in there and widen the road a little bit without too much trouble. So on the side, um, so that would be on the right hand side of the road as you're going down towards the dead end. Um, but before you reach the old pottery studio, um, Rick was able to go in there with a road grader and just widen it a little bit and carve out um, some area within the right of way on the side of the road and then he laid down some gravel and then he actually painted some uh, white line parking spots in there. I'm sure it won't last forever, but so we now
uh, Chief True and Rick Molaski and Steve uh, worked with us to to get that resolved because I I hated to think of people not being able to park down there um, because it was being used a lot. Um, uh, very popular area right now. So I don't know if anyone's been down there since then, but I encourage you to go down there and you should have no problem parking on the side of the road there now. Um, so I was very happy with the outcome of that. Um, Thanks for that, Patrick. That was very quick action on your part um, as well as the guys who helped. So thank yeah, you you're welcome. I, I really appreciate their help. I, I just Yeah, I'd like to say thanks on that as well. Oh because that's, thanks, that's an area that I use as well and I, I know I'm not alone. Yeah. It's great to see it being accessible. Yeah, it's really important. I mean I there's so many people um, trying to use public land right now, and uh, we don't want to have people lose access. Um, okay, I'm going to skip down to number five, because I don't know if this will require a motion, but I think we should discuss it. Um, so we are officially in political campaign season, and um, one of the things that came up was that um, people put political signs on land, sometimes in the right of way. They're supposed to get permission um, from a private property owner. So if you had someone wanting to put a political sign in front of your house, they're supposed to ask you because uh, even though you don't own the right of way or the right of way is public area, they're supposed to still ask your permission. Um, so with with town land, um, you're really not supposed to post um, political signs on town land. That's that's very clear. Um, it's a little less clear with conservation land because one, it's not always town land. So we had an example of this where you had um, Tuttle Swamp. Uh, property, which does have a sign in front of it, and somebody uh, posted a political sign right in front of that. And so I did ask them um, to remove that. Um, I did talk to both um, the code enforcement officer, Mike Hoffman, and um, again, Chief True, because technically the police department is responsible for removing any political signs that are improperly placed. Um, but I, but, but Mike thought it would be a good idea for us to maybe even just officially have a motion saying that we, um, we don't approve of political signs. I, I would tend to agree with that. I, I don't want to be seen as favoring any one candidate for a political office by allowing them to put signs on conservation land. So um, if we passed a motion that would just make Mike and I think Chief True feel more confident that, hey, you guys addressed it. And now if there's a sign out there, they'll try and reach out to the candidate to remove it or they can just remove it um, through their own jurisdictional responsibilities. So I don't know if anyone has any questions or thoughts on that. Um, any comments? I agree. I agree. Thanks for bringing it up, Patrick. I agree. Okay. So again, I, I, the motion that I would make is that the New Market Conservation Commission um, does not all permit any political signs to be placed on uh, new market conservation properties, um, regardless of any candidate, any office. Um, and uh, so that's the motion. So I'll go ahead and take a roll call on that. Um, Can I say one thing real quick? Should it say sure. political signs or other advertisements? Yes, advertisements. Um, 
we can we can talk about advertising, but that is covered actually under new market um, code. So if you put a advertisement sign out there, there's already an existing statute for any advertising sign on any right of way, whether it's private or public land, those are not allowed in new market. Um, I was just thinking so much advertising like commercial advertising, like on a oh, okay. view. I was thinking like a, a political event might have an advertisement that doesn't say um, in big letters like vote for Chris Blackstone, but it might say the barn burner party benefit is Tuesday night. When in fact, if you looked it up on your phone, you would say like, oh, that's a political campaign event, advertisement for an event for Blackstone running for something. I meant that kind of. How about okay. a political or, in, or any affiliated um, events or something like that? Sure, so no, no signs for political candidates or for any kind of political activity. Yeah, I Maybe. feel more comfortable advertising, advertising political activity. Okay, thank you. thank you. So that's the motion. Um, did we have a second on that? I'll second Chris, it. Chris, thanks. Okay. Uh, Sarah? Approve in favor. Melissa? In favor. Ellen? Yes. Chris? Yes. Sam? Yes. Okay. And I was an I as well. Okay. It's zero, zero. Yep. Um, oh, okay. This was another one of those things that came to me sort of randomly. Um, so Lamprey River swimming. Um, I had some people report to me that when they were swimming in the water, um, they were getting coated with some dark algae that they would notice when they got out of the water. So they had some questions about it. Um, so they actually contacted um, one of the experts over at UNH, and Ellen might know his name. I'd have to look it up here. Um, let's see, his name is Jim Haney. He's kind of one of the uh, sort of major experts in algaes and other kinds of things that we're seeing in water sources. Um, so he took a look at it and he said, that it is, um, they're referred to as German, so I'll, if I butcher it, I'm apologizing in advance. It's offwuchs, um, which are uh, um, organisms that one finds growing on aquatic vegetation. So it's not actually an algae, although it appeared to be an algae. Um, and it's released or disrupted and released, and then it gets into the water and it's floating to the surface, and it tends to stick to things. And so that's why you would might feel like you're coated with something, um, but it's not anything that's um, it's not anything that causes any health problems. Uh, uh, as far as um, as uh, Dr. Haney was aware of, so, but I what I don't know, and maybe Chris might be an answer, have an answer for this. Uh, does does the state ever test the Lamprey River for swimming at any point during any given summer to say whether it's safe to swim there or not? points along the river that are taken care of by different groups. The state is only doing state uh, locations like um, there's a beach site in Barrington the state has agreed to do or counties have agreed to test on a basis with a working relationship with the community. 
but the advisories that go out are, uh, it's so much easier with the beach because that whole thing is the state and they'll put out an advisory like they recently did for just some things that were found at North Beach over in Hampton. Um, right. But this might be the kind of thing that might be worth a, a note in the e-news the, through the lamp, um, through Steve Fournier, through Tim. Tim's the e editor now of the e-news, the town newsletter. So maybe something like that in a place like that could be good. Or is this a one-off? Did, did the people give you any information back from their connection to UNH and discuss at all the prognosis for the longevity of the conditions that are making this algae even grow? No, I didn't get that much detail on it. Um, I was I was just more concerned when I hear, you know, like, I just wanted to rule out that it was anything like cyanobacteria or anything like that, because I was like, it's been so warm, the water's so low, so there's very little... Um, you know, flow to the river right now. I guess it's, yeah. you know, under 100 CFs or something like that. I mean, it's so it's kind of right. Low, just the capacity that it has for the number of people that are swimming there and using it. Yeah, even. Yep. Oh boy, that's a sticky wicket. Um, I guess yeah, I know. Uh, I can. I just. Go on. Sorry. No, I just that. Yeah, if you could ask, I just want to make sure because I know probably more people than ever are using it right now, you yeah, know, yeah. because, um, well, we know people use it, right? We know people that's that is the really the only freshwater swimming area that we really have in Newmarket is the Lamprey River, and there's quite a few dock systems and condo complexes where people access the river and swim in it. Um, and so I just want to make sure that if we ever did get kind of any kind of, you know, water quality issue, we're able to, to get it out to people relatively quickly. Yeah, um, let me borrow the flow of that for this part of the river and with the number of volunteers they have versus the number of, of locations being done um, on the professional side. Yeah, I mean, I almost wanted to ask, is there a way to request that we put it on a list with the state? Or you're saying if it's not a state beach, they're not going to they're not going to do it. It sounds like. Well, they do have relationships with some towns to do some testing. And I want to say Barrington is one of those towns. But um, there might be other ones that I don't know of or cannot think of right off the top of my head right now. Um, OK. But certainly the health and the, the just the, the load of people, the carrying capacity is is probably pretty well maxed out between the couple of heat waves we've had and just the fact that it's plain old summer. So um, I can find out what I can find out and I'll send you an email, Patrick, and then you can figure out what you want to do with it or how you want to disseminate that information. Okay. No, I'm sorry Thank anybody you. was swimming there and had a concern, but wow, applause to them for getting in touch and letting you know what their concern and information held. Yeah, and I was really impressed that they were able to get a hold of Jim Haney so quickly because like he is considered sort of the expert, subject matter expert, I believe, on sort of the different kinds of things that are appearing in water systems. Like I saw him quoted for an article about, you know, bacteria that's shown up in across all of New England. So he is kind of a subject matter expert in that area. So wow. um, that was great that they were able to consult him when I heard them say, oh, well, I'm going to go ask Jim Haney. I was like, oh, well, that's great. Yeah, whatever he says has a lot of standing because he's kind of, that's his area of expertise. Yeah, that's, that's impressive. But yeah, I just, I just want to make sure that we're on top of it. And if there was ever anything we could do, cause I don't, you know, I, I do know people, I guess they also go swimming right off of um, Slide Rock, you know, which is the conservation area there. Um, at the end of Salmon Street, right? Is that the right street that I'm saying? Or is it the Cassock Street? 
it's it's right there where people access where the boat launch is. There's people that swim right there. I've seen them. I so I just want to make sure that if people are swimming and there's any concerns that we were on top of it because I would wouldn't want anyone to swim in a place that's not safe for them to swim. All right. Um, so we heard, I think, Heron Point. Um, Ellen, I, do you do you think it makes sense to um, sort of roll the management plan into the sign? And um, you know, you're going to do a. We were going to have you do a sign and a um, the trail map. Do you want to wait on that at this point until after the management plan is is put together, or do you think that could still proceed separately? Um, I think we could. Well, we can't do the map until we complete the trail network, because that would the map would go on the sign. So, you know, we've kind of gone through the worst of heavy traffic with summer COVID and all this. Yeah. Um, we could talk to the foresters and see how much you know if they're out eight months, you know, that's not until next year. So we might want to go ahead with our the trail network, trail network we're thinking of and we could change it later, I suppose. But I think it might be worth at least waiting a little bit more. Drew and I have not had time to go back out. You know, lots of stuff going on. So um, I don't think we do a lot more damage by waiting. Okay. So maybe we should wait, see what the foresters say, get a timeline and say, this is what we need, you know, we want to do. We want to wrap it all in together. I do know um, the foresters trail stuff too, like they can give us advice on that. So it might be worth waiting. Okay, that sounds good. All right, so the next thing I wanted to talk about was the Shopmeyer Park management plan. Um, Ellen, you had a chance to go out there and um, meet with the chair of the Shopmeyer Park Committee, Richie Shelton. Um, did you want to provide any summary from what you learned at that meeting? Well, sure. So, um, and he, I know he's provided some some updates to you, Patrick, too, in terms of, you know, the, the Schottmeyer Park Committee has obviously been working on the park ever since its inception. And they've been doing a lot of stuff and they're continuing to do some things. Um, so there, the one thing that the Conservation Commission is supposed to do is write the management plan. And it's a very small area. Most of the information that would go into that is to write about what's already been done in terms of the infrastructure what are the ongoing infrastructure needs and maintenance? And then who's going to do this sort of the ongoing stuff? And if there's any additional work to be done. Um, so it doesn't say that the, so the deed says, the deed from the church to the town for the easement for this park says that the Conservation Commission is supposed to develop. The it does not say that the Conservation Commission has to be the one to oversee and fund be in charge of the park. Um, so that's, I think, the big thing we need, why a plan is important, and that that plan would then state who is responsible for what things. Because there's things like snow plowing the road, um, maintaining the driveway, installing the docks and taking them out. Um, who's going to work with the person who's volunteering to mow? You know, at some point that person may not mow, so there's some pieces like that. And there may be some additional work. Right now, it's the, all the management is still within the park uh, committee, which I think is fine because Richie's continuing to do a lot of good work out there with volunteers. So I had offered to Patrick to, um, you know, draft up a, at least an outline of a management plan that we could work through. Haven't had a chance to do that, but hopefully by the next meeting, that would basically pull. Basically, what you do is you just pull the information out of the deed, and have some maps and we have all the information. It's all in various, in, in, you know, it's all documented out there. So I think it would be pretty easy to pull together. So the thing we would talk about next month and maybe talk to like Rick Molaski and Steve Fournier before next meeting is to get their commitment as to what they're willing or able to do. So, hey, if you want, let's push for the September meeting. We spend a little bit more time as a new agenda item to talk about the management plan. 
and I hope we okay. will have a draft for you before then. That sounds great. Um, yeah, I can. The updates that Richie had were that they've now installed the kayak dock, um, which he sent me a picture of, but I don't know that I have that. But so what that looks like is a dock that allows you to sort of pull in and um, there's an assist so you can get out of your kayak and much easier. Um, so it's it's very nice. It, I mean, if you're a kayaker, this is uh, like deluxe parking basically for you. So it's really nice. Um, they worked on some of the drainage um, towards the middle of the grassy area of the park. Um, there was a lot of water that came in actually from a bordering property, which had a drain pipe that just fed out into the property. And so they, they put a drainage pipe through there so that that water funnels towards where all the, uh, the rest of the water on the property goes, which is into a small stream, seasonal stream. Um, and then they've also, they're also working to expand uh, the garden a little bit more. And they put in um, a picnic table and there's, I do have a picture of that. So I'll, I'll just uh, share that for a second. So you all can see that. So you can see this is, um, if you guys can see that, um, there's the where they put the picnic table in and I believe they'll have a second picnic table just like this. Um, and you can see where they're starting to expand the garden a little bit. I think it's going to be right over here. And this is where they address the drainage right there in the middle. And then this is where they mow uh, the grass path that takes you down to the dock, which you can kind of see right there in the very distance. So it's really, really looks fabulous. I mean, it really, uh, it looks like a park. I mean, I think it's right when this um, management plan gets completed, um, which she's very, uh, thankfully, she's offered to do for us. Um, I think this makes sense that this would belong in the town's jurisdiction completely as far as managing it because it is a, it's a very traditional kind of park and they are you know they want to use it for part of their recreation plan of kayaking so they'll have somewhere down here the the kayak storage and um you know I think it'll be it's going to be a wonderful thing as it continues to develop and They've done a great job of, of creating a, a park that, um, you know, people can, can come to and enjoy. So um, I, I look forward to, uh, to that. And, and I do think that long term, it does make sense that the town will be involved in, in managing it. It's, it's much more in their sort of purview. Um, the only other thing I have, which I still don't have an update, is on uh, the Shanda Park fence. I'm still working on that. Um, I'd like to get some more estimates um, to try and see if I could um, get it, the price down a little bit lower. Um, but I'll hope to have guys in September on that. Um, the only other thing I wanted to make sure and bring up was um, we talked about having some more guests and I wanted to make sure that we wrote down some of the upcoming guests that people were interested in inviting. Uh, Chris, you had someone I thought that you talked about wanting to invite. I did. I'm interested, or I think the group would be interested in Dr. Matt Tarr from UNH. He's an expert on, or he would be the guy I would call to talk to us about um, the ongoing issue about mowing big fields and when is the best time of year or the safest time of year considering wildlife to do that. 
he's a wildlife habitat specialist, but he could tell us a lot about not only the migrating um, insects or butterflies, but also about um, layers and stages and what to leave and what kind of areas to leave with the consideration of songbirds and migrating mm -hmm. birds. So that would be one of my first choices and it could be timely for September because that would help us understand a bit about the mulling of the fields that we've been talking about. Did or you want to... Oh, sorry, go on. Did you want to try and get him for September? I would love... It's also part oh. of the uh, cooperative extension outreach is that, that whole crew and everybody in that department, it's part of their... Uh, passion and job description to, to do outreach for towns and communities and groups and whatnot. So I can I certainly ask him. There's also the um, another wildlife expert that could be interesting is Haley Androsi. She's actually on the Deerfield Conservation Commission, but she runs a group that does a lot, um, the Coverts group, or she runs a lot of trainings about taking care of or an enticing wildlife or finding, locating ways to make your property attractive to wildlife. I'll try Matt Tarr first. Okay. So that meeting would be the 10th of September, just so you have it down. Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, would we like, I mean, I could ask, I could ask Haley as well. Um, for October, I don't mind asking another person, and I could have her tailor hers a little bit differently. She might tailor something, um, especially now that we've talked a little bit, um, heard tonight's presentation a little bit about the invasives. It could be interesting to hear more about invasive plants and kind of what to look for, and even on people's own properties. Last year, every month, Ellen and I ran a column, an article on the New Market newsletter about invasives, and that got a lot of attention and, and people asking further questions about it. So it could be something to really write on tonight's presentation and get into some more information about invasives. Well, that sounds great. All right. Well, I'll do something for September and, I mean, yeah, September and October. Is that what I just heard? Yep. So okay. October's... Okay meeting would be um, the 8th. That's a very early meeting. That's an early one. Um, is that the, is that, oh, October 8th, that's fine. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, right. And I'll get you their exact names for the agenda and whatnot, but I'll do that for September and October, Patrick. Okay. All right. Um, the last item I wanted to bring up for everyone to consider is um, when I went by the town um, tonight or today, um, they told me that um, uh, that the, the auditorium is available. Um, we want to go back to being inside. So the way that works is that um, uh, there's about six feet of space between each person and you're, you basically got like a whole table to yourself. Um, so I wanted to offer that out. I personally um, would rather continue with this type of meeting, doing it this way. Um, I don't, I don't feel like we don't usually have that many members of the public and I haven't, I haven't had too many items come our way recently, but um Uh, this is Ellen. I would prefer the Zoom. Uh, I think the yeah. Chris, that Chris mentioned would probably pr prefer Zoom than to have to come to the town hall. I would, yeah. say, I would strongly prefer Zoom, and I think, uh, oddly enough, COVID or not, I think we can get guests 
to a guest each month, I, I'm willing to guess that we're going to have better luck with guests via Zoom. Yeah. But I think we could, um, we stand a better chance of getting, you know, community participation as well. We could start to, you know, market it a little bit on social media, talk up, um, you know, attendance and participation. Everybody's welcome. I think, um, especially if we're going to have guests, um, that might be a good idea. Okay, well, I, I'm just going to, I'm not going to make any motion. If, if anybody would like to um, uh, you know, make a motion about meeting in the auditorium, please feel free to do that. But that's, I, I'm not pushing it on anyone. I, I have no, we have no directive to resume meetings. It was more, it's available if we want, if we want it. But there's no request that we go back into the auditorium or town hall. I just want to make that clear. I haven't received any formal notification that that's a requirement for us. Um, I did have a couple letters here. I guess I should have, make sure we review before I we call it a night. Um, so uh, one letter is from uh, division of the state division of forest and lands that um, they're going to do some timber harvest out at the Cromit and Lumberland Creeks wildlife management area. Um, and um, they're just putting us on notice that they're going to be transporting those logs through New Market after they take them. So that was one thing. Um, another is that um, the um, town of New Market Public Works has submitted um, their permit um, for the dam reconstruction. Um, and their plan is on September 1st, they will begin the Lamprey River impoundment um, as part of the project. So um, so that's that's their plan right now, it sounds like, to uh, if they get permission from the state to do that, that they will um, they will they will lower it. Um, it says the rate of water release during the lowering will not exceed uh, more than six inches per day in order to allow fish, wildlife, and invertebrates time to adjust to the changing water level upstream of the dam. During the active drawdown period, which is expected to be from September 1st through October 31st, um, the water will be released continually to assure aquatic life downstream of the dam is afforded needed quality habitat. So um, it looks like my understanding is they're they're picking this window because um, they don't want to mess with the water uh, levels uh, once things start to get frozen hard on the river. Uh, I know that that's when a lot of amphibians and other creatures actually burrow into the mud um, to winter over. So they're probably have picked this time to try and mitigate anything like that. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any questions about that, but that's that's the plan. And if that gets uh, if that gets allowed by the state, I'm assuming that that's coming up fairly soon. That we would start to see the water level drop. 
Patrick? Yes. September 1st and to, to October 31st. But the right. drawdown will not exceed six inches per day until right. a little later. And then it's going to go faster to help the habitat downriver? No, it just means that they'll they'll always keep it open so that there is always even after the drawdown, they're going to have they're going to continue to allow water to pass, right? They're never going to completely shut off water from passing, is what they're saying. All right. So even All right. after the drawdown, they'll they'll still have to have the gates fully open to allow to allow water because if water doesn't get down, then I guess you know the water would become very salty. <laughs> below the dam, which it normally isn't that salty. There's a mixture of creatures in there that I think rely on it being sort of brackish. Um, the other thing that uh, is important that we got is we did receive a permit application um, for Chicks Weir to store over the winter, um, beginning in October, uh, the weir on Shanda Park. Um, we had Mr. Collins, who manages the weir, come and speak to us about the weir. Um, so everyone should be familiar with what Chick's Weir is, but if you aren't, let me know. Um, so, his request is from October 2020 to um, June 2021. Um, I don't, I just got this today. He just signed it this. Um, I'm wondering if we should consider this at the next meeting and I can reach out to Mr. Collins and ask him and invite him to be here in case anyone has any questions regarding his permit request. Um, so unless there's an objection to that, that's what I would do. I would I will give him a call and say, hey, we're going to discuss your permit request um, at our next meeting, um, which is early September, and um, you can appear to answer any questions. Any? Does anyone have any thoughts on that or concerns? Sounds like a good plan. Okay. All right. So I will, I will reach out to Mr. Collins to do that. Um, Uh, just looking at this to see if there's anything else here in the mail. Um, looks like we got uh, we got a brochure from the um, the state is now producing a newsletter for the Drinking Water and Groundwater Bureau. Um, and they just send you information about the work that they're doing and um, you know, the projects that they're funding. Um, this is, you know, we had the big settlement with the MBTE, I think is what it's called, uh, Fossil Fuel Company Settlement. And um, that is the primary funding for this, and they're working on different projects um, across the state. I believe Newmarket actually got some funding for their new um, purification, uh, water purification plant that they've got. Um, so other than that, there's no other mail on here other than a edition of Great Bay Matters. So. With that, I believe we've reviewed everything. Um, if there are no objections. I will make a motion to adjourn.
Second. All in, All in favor? Aye. Chris Blackstone, aye. aye. Oh, aye. Melissa, Any aye. Patrick, aye. Sarah, aye. Sam, aye. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take nice care. to see you all. Have a good night. Take care. Bye-bye.